Welcome everyone to Straight Science. Um, Straight Science is a evening seminar series put on by UAF Northwest Campus here in Nome, as well as UAF Alaska Sea Grant also here in Nome. And both Northwest Campus and Alaska Sea Grant, we are public servants of the Bering Strait region. We serve all peoples of the Bering Strait region which is the homeland and waters of the Inupiaq, Yupik, and St. Lawrence Island Yupik peoples. Now tonight in the Bering Strait region, there is nothing better than having a walrus related talk. Well, even if you're out of the Bering Strait region, there's nothing better than having a walrus related talk because we want to hear the latest on walruses, how they're doing, what's going on, who's doing what, and what you find. So we're so excited tonight because we have two speakers. They're going to tag team and they, they're going to pause in between each other's presentation to allow for questions. So if you can hold your questions until one is done, and then we'll have, you know, we'll all ask them questions again at the, at the end of the second. So the first speaker tonight is Bill Beatty. He is a research wildlife biologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, which, as we know, is the research arm of for walruses. So the U.S. Geological Survey does research on polar bear and um, walruses and sea otters, but they don't count up here. And he is actually sort of can, can do it all from Anchorage and Wisconsin. And tonight he's in Wisconsin giving it to us. And it is already 930 at night. So we thank you, Bill, uh, already for for coming at us from a different time zone and taking the effort to talk to us tonight. So that's awesome. Irina Trukanova is a wildlife biologist with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Marine Mammals Management. Now, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has the management authority of walruses, polar bear, and of course, sea otters, but we don't, we don't worry about them up here. And so she's coming at this from the management side of the house, and she works in Anchorage and Seattle kind of like Bill dueling it, and she is currently in Seattle. So our speakers are on a much later time zone than we are, and we are really grateful for that. So we are going to hear about this upcoming research cruise, which I think has local um, local involvement as well, and we'll be in and out of Nome. So we're excited about this topic, and I won't say any more, and I'll, I'll let Bill, you're going to go first. Take it away. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah, thank you, Gay, and thanks everyone for tuning in. So as Gay mentioned, we're going to be, um, we, we split the seminar into two different sections. So I'll take you through the first section where I'll discuss the first generation of Pacific Walrus research cruises, which occurred from 2013 to 2017. These research cruises were joint efforts with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and U.S. Geological Survey. And they produced two major pieces of information uh, relevant for this talk today. That is uh, information on walrus abundance and of course, wal information on walrus population trend. So Irina is then gonna discuss the second generation of research cruises, which will be starting actually this summer um, on June 5th, leaving from Nome. So the USGS and the US Fish and Wildlife Service were, were two separate government agencies as Gay alluded to. We have two different missions. So the USGS is the research arm uh, responsible for researching Pacific walruses, while the US Fish and Wildlife Service is, um, has management authority as the management agency for Pacific walruses. However, we work really closely together towards a common goal. And uh, the common goal here um, is to understand walrus population dynamics. So the first generation of research cruises was a large multi-agency project that um, spanned uh, five years of field work, but lasted over 10 years of planning and data analysis. So each research cruise took place about, uh, took about a year to plan and organize in of itself, um, in addition to the pre-planning that started in 2011 and all the analysis and data management 
um, they had to wrap that wrap things up this past fall, actually, with with a publication in twenty fall of twenty twenty two. But really, it takes a small army to plan and execute these research cruises and all the data and analysis that goes into it. And the, all of the the names listed here are all the folks that contributed to to the research cruises. Um, that first range of research cruises. So in, a, um, in terms of the data analysis and getting out the, the information, we had lots of other people that helped out on a cruise here or a cruise there, but these were the major players. So as Gay alluded to, the, um, the Pacific Walrus is jointly managed by the US government, Alaska natives, and the Russian Federation and Russian um, um, Chicoka natives. So it's a joint, um, we jointly manage the population, but it's one of two subspecies of walrus. The other subspecies of walrus out there is called the Atlantic walrus. Um, the Atlantic walrus uh, stretches from Hudson Bay all the way to the Kara Sea, and they number around 22,000 animals um, is the best guess out there. That um, Laptev walrus, which you see there in orange at the top of the, let's see if I can get my point work. There we go, an orange up there. Um, that's considered an isolated subpopulation of the Pacific walrus. But for our, for, but for management purposes, it's, it's, like I said, it's considered isolated and we don't, um, we, we can't really even access it because of the, the isolated nature of it in, in Russia as well, so. So from now on, when I say walrus, I'm referring to Pacific walrus. So real quickly, most of us probably know this, but uh, Pacific walruses feed on bottom dwelling invertebrates such as clams, slugs, and snails. They make short dives to the bottom of the seafloor to acquire that food. And their dives last anywhere from two to 10 minutes. And they're only diving 80 to 120 meters generally in the Chuck G Sea, pretty shallow from continental shelf areas. Sea ice is an important habitat for Pacific walruses. It's used in courtship and breeding, birthing and nursing, and most commonly used as a resting platform that walruses haul out on between foraging bouts. When sea ice is not available, they will rest on land where they typically gather in really large aggregations, um, like the haul out we, we've seen at Point Lay forming over the past 20 to 25 years. So Pacific walrus is a, obviously a vital subsistence resource for communities. Um, Alaska Native communities, especially on St. Lawrence Island. Um, and ivory carving is also an important cultural tradition for many Alaska Native communities. It provides a source of income to artists in these communities, but it also acts as an outreach tool um, for our purposes that uh, for the subsistence way of life that Alaska Natives live. So the beautiful artwork that you all create um, makes it for people like me that are down south down here really communicate how important walruses are and ivory carving is and culturally and also that leads can lead a conversation to subsistence lifestyle. So in the winter, the entire Pacific walrus population is concentrated in the Bering Sea and breeding takes place in January, generally at three different locations shown in gray here. But as sea ice melts in the spring, adult males separate from adult females and juveniles. Females and juveniles follow the ice melt north into the, um, from the Bering Sea into the Chukchi Sea, whereas most adult males remain in the Bering Sea. And so you get a summer distribution that looks like this. We've got adult males foraging in the Bering Sea and resting at coastal haulouts, whereas you've got juveniles and adult females in the Chukchi Sea foraging in the, those really productive continental shelf waters and resting on sea ice between foraging bouts. So our sampling for this project and for these research cruises was generally in the Chukchi Sea, a little bit in the Northern Bering Sea, as you'll see in a few slides. Um, but, but most of our sampling was, sampling was concentrated in the Chukchi Sea to target that juvenile and adult female population or segment of the population. So Arctic sea ice, is, as we all know, is rapidly declining. This has been demonstrated through observations, but also modeling. 
Um, declining sea ice and the importance of walruses to communities in the Bering Strait region require information on walrus population abundance and population dynamics. Historically, walrus population abundance has been estimated with aerial surveys, but abundance estimates from these surveys have suffered from low precision or an incomplete accounting of uncertainty. And I'll explain what that means in the next couple of slides here. So it's easiest to illustrate these com concepts with uh, the historical aerial survey data, which you see here on the graph. On the lower axis, you've got year that the aerial survey was done. And on the vertical axis here, you've got abundance, what, we, what the aerial survey estimated the population to be at the time. So when we estimate abundance of any species in, in Western science and wildlife ecology, we estimate, we estimate what we call a point estimate. And here that's shown in these black circles. So basically a point estimate, you can think about it as, as if you asked, um, if you forced me to tell you how many walruses there were in each of these years, and you just wanted me to use one number, that's the number I would give. That's the point estimate. It's our best guess, best single number guess. But as we know, that's not all to the story. We also wanna quantify how confident we are in that point estimate. And this is precision. And it's typically given as a range of values. And for abundance, it's given as a positive, a range of positive values, obviously, because there can't be a negative number of walruses out there. So we call the range of values, um, this, the confidence interval or the credible interval, that just depends on how the data is analyzed. But for our purposes here, they're, they're essentially the same thing. They're telling us, telling you how confident we are in that point estimate. So the wider the confidence intervals, the lower precision and the less confident we are in that point estimate. So you can really illustrate this by looking at the last aerial survey in 2006, which estimated about 130,000 walruses. You can see that in the point estimate here. But the confidence interval was huge. It was about 55,000 to half a million walruses. This isn't very good, obviously. We need to do better than that. We need to tighten those confidence intervals so we can have a little more, um, speak with a little more certainty about how many walruses are out there. So we needed a different approach to estimate walrus abundance. And we identified something called genetic marker capture as that alternative approach. And to do this, we conducted research cruises in the Chukchi Sea in June of each year from 2013 to 2017. That's what we're calling the first generation of walrus research cruises. And on these research cruises, we collected biopsy samples from walruses hauled out on sea ice. So what is genetic mark recapture? Well, we'll take it in two different uh, components here. We'll first start with mark recapture. So this is just gonna be a brief introduction to kind of what it is and, and how it's used. And it's important because it's the gold standard for estimating animal abundance and other demographic rates in wildlife ecology. So let's take a really simple example where we want to estimate the number of some animal, um, which I'm using here is um, using white circles to represent here. So let's call this a, a population of, of Arctic ground squirrels, for example. So the first step to mark recapture is we go out and we capture some animals. Let's say on the first time we do this, we capture 20 animals. And let's say we, it takes a little bit of yellow spray paint and we spray paint the tail just a little bit. Uh, they actually used to do this way back when. We, people don't do this anymore <laughs> for obvious reasons, but this was done way back in the day when this method was first being used. So let's spray paint their animal, their tail yellow, so we know that we can, uh, that it's been caught if we see it again. So then we um, release all the animals back into the wild, all with spray painted yellow tails. We let them run around, we go out and we capture them again. So on the second capture occasion, let's say we captured again, we captured 20 animals, so we're pretty consistent, but only five of them were marked. And we know that because they had those yellow tails. So you can use some relatively simple math here to estimate the number of Arctic ground squirrels in the population. And for this example, it was it's 80 animals. But it's a pretty straightforward concept. Um, 
And this was developed almost 60, 70 years ago now, and it's been advancing since then in um, the Western science literature, more and more complexity introduced to these sorts of approaches. But this is the general approach behind all of, all of the different flavors you have out there of mark recapture. The other part of genetic mark recapture, of course, is that genetic component, right? And so the genetic component doesn't require, it's great because it doesn't require any physical capture or physical tagging of, of an animal. We, we don't have to spray paint a tail yellow. We don't have to put a tag on them, a physical tag. We don't have to ban them. All we need is a tissue sample, which we take to a lab and we generate what's called a multi-locus genotype with, with that tissue sample in the lab. Basically, you just get a string of DNA, um, of DNA for an animal. And you can use that DNA fingerprint, fingerprint to identify individuals. So that DNA fingerprint, that genotype acts as a tag, essentially. So then what we do is we take all the information from all these different tissue samples, all this genetic information, we compare every sample to every other sample. So it's, it's a big job. It doesn't take too long nowadays, but it used to take a long time ago, 15, 20 years ago, it used to take a long time. But now we can do this pretty quickly. And if we get two samples that match with their genetic information, that's the same animal. So we call that a recapture. And in mark recapture methods, um, recaptures are really important. They're what I call the currency of any mark recapture analysis. They're really what you need to, to get any good information out of it in terms of abundance and population dynamics. So again, we did this from 2013 to 2017. We're going out and we're collecting these tissue samples for the genetic mark recapture project. And I'll just briefly go through the, the, um, the map for each of these research cruises to show you where we were. In 2013, we were on the, the um, research vessel Norseman 2, left from Nome um, in early June. And you can see the track there. This, this case ventured south into the Bering Sea, probably tracking some ice and some groups. Um, but again, most of the sampling was in the Chukchi Sea between Point Hope and Point Lay. In 2014, again, we had the Norseman 2, uh, again, left from Nome in a very, very similar approach. Um, I should also point out that in 2013 and 2014, we were just restricted to U.S. waters, the U.S. exclusive economic zone. And you can see that from the tracks here on the, on the map. So that changed in 2015. We chartered a Russian flag vessel, the Professor Moltnovsky, um, and where the, the crew met the ship offshore in Nome. Um, the ship was not allowed to dock that year in Nome, so they met them offshore using skiffs and covered a lot more ground that year because we um, accessed the exclusive economic zone of Russia. So we covered a lot more ground that year. Um, and you can see the got a lot further north that year as well with ice conditions. In 2016, again, we were on the Professor Molnowski, that Russian flagship. Um, in 2016, we weren't allowed into the Russian, Russian waters that year um, for reasons un, truly unknown to us. Uh, we never got the permits and the permission to do that. But we were back in 2017, the last research cruise in this first generation of research cruises. We're back in um, Russian waters. You can see that year how far north we got. Um, it's even, looks like it might even be cut off a little bit with the, with the Zoom slide here. But again, left from Nome. Um, started um, motored for Russian waters initially. Um, and then we transitioned over to the US waters later in the cruise about halfway through. So each year is pretty variable, right? It, everybody knows that it really depends on ice conditions and even weather conditions as well. So I just got a brief video here that I'll share with you. Um, it's, it shows you the sampling and um, so you guys can see how this is actually done. These biopsies are actually collected. Maybe Bill, can you walk us through a little bit what you're, what's going on? Yeah, so 
uh, first of all, this is the GoPro, so it's wide angle. So they're actually a lot closer than, than it looks. Um, and there's a driver behind the camera and the camera is mounted on, a, on the, the pedestal. And now the two shooters um, are, I, right now they're, they're looking at walruses, what we got on the ice here and trying to identify each animal um, to the age and sex. Um, and I'll show that in the next slide to pick out who, what, who they're gonna shoot for. And then when they shoot, when the driver puts the motor in neutral actually. And so no one's talking. We're approaching from downwind as well. And then once they go in the water, then they'll communicate communicate about what what they sampled, who they sampled, the age and sex of that animal. Of course, the weather isn't always that beautiful, but <laughs> that was an especially nice day. So in the field. Um, as I alluded to in that video, biopsy crews assigned age to each sampled animal based on the length of the tusk compared to the width or the depth of the snout. And this method was developed by a, a walrus biologist uh, way back in the 1980s. His name was Bud Fay. And it's been used quite a bit since then um, for this purpose. For our purposes, we uh, we collapsed all the categories that Bud Fay developed into three different age classes. That's calves, which were just young of the year, born that year, juveniles, which were one to five years old, and adults six, six years and older. We collapsed them into three age classes. But if you remember, since we have genetic marker recapture information, we've got repeated sampling events on the same individual. So that gives us an opportunity to say, hey, how good are we at assigning age? Basically, how consistent are we? We'll use consistent, consistency as a proxy for accuracy, essentially. And it turns out we're, we're not that great. Uh, we're actually better than I thought we would be. <laughs> we assigned the incorrect age about 10% of the time. But we didn't have a lot of samples. So we had to find a way to account for that uncertainty in age assignment. And to do that, we turn to a, a broad class of marker recapture models. And this goes back to all the development I talked about with this class of models that are called multi-event models. So our goal was to estimate walrus abundance while counting for uncertainty in age class. And, and we had to do this. There was really no other way. We didn't have enough recaptured animals to toss out individuals that were assigned different ages. So we had to do this to actually analyze the data. And we can do this actually because um, aging is a consistent process, right? Um, and you know, if you're born um, in one year, you know, can calculate the age of any any animal if given its birth year, right? It's pretty straightforward. We all get a year older each year, right? As much as we want to slow down time, we can't do it. And walruses are no different, obviously. So in the figure here, this shows you just kind of how these models work. On the circles here, we've got the age of the animal. But these ages are unknown, and we're fully acknowledging that in this analysis. It's kind of the beauty of this, this approach. We're fully acknowledging that we can never truly know the real age of an animal, right? We can get some, a pretty good idea and be pretty confident on it, but there's always going to be a little bit of uncertainty if we're honest about it, right? And that's what these models use as well. They really embrace that uncertainty and account for it in the analysis. But again, we know that each year an animal gets older. It's a really simple concept that these models are based off of. So let's say we then collect data on this animal in 2014, where it's five, and we collect data on it twice. And they're independent observations, and we call the juvenile twice, right? Pretty good. So we got it right, but we don't actually know that. You know, we're a little more confident that's a juvenile because we sampled it twice. But let's say we sample this animal again in 2015. It's now six years old. Again, we don't know that for sure, but the data we collected said it's an adult two times, we, the first two times we sampled it. And let's say the third time we sampled it, we called it a juvenile. So there's a little bit uncertainty there, right? 
But these models embrace that uncertainty and account for it in the data analysis. Of course, if you were, if you were forcing anybody to, to tell you how old this animal was, you would say it was a juvenile in 2014 and an adult in 2015. But we want to account for some of that, a little bit of that uncertainty um, for that outstanding juvenile age assignment in 2015. But again, this really is just based off the simple fact that age is a consistent process. You can't, you can't stop and you can't slow it down. So we collected about 9,300 tissue samples over the five-year project. And this map just shows the distribution of those tissue samples with the red line showing the international boundary. Um, again, one important thing to know is that we were in, we accessed Russian waters in just two of the five years of the study. So we sampled only in US waters in three of the five years. And so again, a few, a few samples in the Bering Sea, but the vast majority of samples are in the Chukchi Sea. So the 9,300 tissue samples, that actually boiled down to um, 8,165 animals that we used for this analysis. And so how many walruses are out there? Well, I will show you what's called um, the posterior distribution for total abundance. And I'll kind of walk you through what this means. This is the posterior distribution essentially just means this is the whole range of possible values that we could, we could get for walrus abundance. It's a way to show us the confidence interval, in this case, the credible interval of a point estimate. So this, so, so this graph has shown that the point estimate for walrus abundance as of 2017 was two and about 267, or pardon me, 260,000 walruses. But remember I talked about credible interval or confidence interval. The 95% credible interval was about 171,000 to 366,000 walruses. And this posterior distribution, that graph on the left, that's just showing those numbers graphically from the model, directly from the model output. So the black center line is the average, that's 260,000. The black dotted line is the lower credible interval. The upper dotted line is the upper credible interval, 366,000. All these, these um, bars out here are outside that 95% range. So we kind of kind of toss them and say they're not really used for inference in terms of the population total of final population size. So we just take that middle 95% for inference. And this is a, a standard of, of output from any sort of analysis like this. So another thing that these cruise, research cruises did was, um, was collect age structure data, right? Because abundance is one piece of the puzzle, right? We're just giving you um, three numbers essentially, right? It doesn't really give us a lot of information on how the population is doing, right? And that's the most frequent question we get is, how, the, how is the population doing and how many are there? Well, we answered that second question. I answered that first because it's a little bit longer in terms of how we sample. And I think more exciting, but I'm biased. But the age structure data gives us information on how the population is doing. Basically, basically what we do is we go out there and on these cruises, we look at these walrus groups and we assign age and sex to each individual in walrus, each walrus group. And we're here, we're not focused on the raw numbers. We're really focused on the percentages. So once we get back from the research cruise, we looked at the percentages in each age class. And again, here we're using that Tusk method um, developed by Bud Fay in um, the 1980s. And the age structure data can then be used with uh, some other sources of data, but it's really the one driving the bus and, and, and the modeling to make give us some inference on population trend. So from the age structure data, which initially was collected way all the way back to the 19, when data collection went all the way back to the 1980s, it wasn't consistently collected each year, but it was started, this, this it was started back in the 1980s by Bud Fay. The, what we can see say is the population declined for about 30 years, starting about 1981, going up to about 2010, give or take a few years. And the graph on the right here shows um, the, the proportion of the population compared to 1981. So that's why 1981 is, is a one here, right? So 
it showed, just shows a decline from that one down to what it is now, which we think it's about 40% of what it was in 1980, give or take a few per some percentage points to that as well. But why did it decline so precipit precipitously in the 1980s? It's, that's a pretty steep decline there for any species, um, let alone so a species as important as walruses to the region. Well, in the 1980s from the age structure data, it's, it's painfully obvious. You can just see it looking at the raw data that it was a really old population. There were lots of older adult females and not that many calves and juveniles. They just weren't reproducing. And the thought was that that population was food limited, that it had reached some type of carrying capacity in the Chukchi Sea. It was also combined with high harvest over and in, in, um, high harvest at the time as well, because conditions were perfect. And frankly, these uh, uh, walruses were, were not doing so, um, so well in terms of food. So that combined for that precipitous decline in the 1980s, it leveled out um, for approaching 2010. And our best information now indicates that the walrus population is stable as of 2015. And with that, I will pause for a little bit for questions about that portion of the talk. And then once I'm finished, I'll turn over to Irina to take us home and um, talk about the next generation of walrus research cruises. All right, thank you, Bill. And before everybody gets their questions, we do have several callers on the line. If you can hear me, callers, and you want to unmute, this is the time callers have precedent. It's straight science because it's really hard. It's terrible to be a caller on a Zoom call because you can't raise your hand or jump up and down or anything like that. So any questions from the callers? Okay. At any time, caller, callers, uh, feel free to jump in with your walrus-related questions. And um, any other questions from the group? Okay. People are enraptured and um, taking it all in, Bill. And so that is great. Irina, are you ready to take over? Yeah, sure. All right. Oh, we do have a question. We do have a question. Go ahead, Katria. Hi, um, thank you so much for the presentation. I was just curious. So um, in this figure, you're showing population stability as of 2015. Mm -hmm. Yep. Katria, was there your your you cut out. I don't know if there was more to that or if that was the question. Is that it, Katria? Were you just asking if that was 2015? Okay. Um, uh, I Sorry, I think I lost you there for a second, okay. but um, I was curious. Um, so when you talk about population stability as of 2015, how many years preceding that does it need to be at the same population for it to be considered stable? Well, we would consider it stable um, based off of, based off of, well, I'll, let me back up a little bit. That's a really good question. For walruses are really tough to study. So our, and our ability to detect population trend in terms of increasing or decreasing or stability, whether it's stable or not, is, is pretty limited right now based off the age structure data and the abundance estimates we're getting. So I would say that age structure data gives us a pretty broad snapshot um, of population trend. So essentially the, the you know, it, it varies around stability. It's varied around stability. You can see that line actually since about 2011, you know, actually going all the way back to 2003, I should say, so because these are the credible intervals here, even before 2003, um, it started, the model started indicating that it, yeah, it might be stable um, as early as the late 90s, early 2000s, but it got even more confident that it was stable or even more confident that it was stable as it approached 2015. And right now, um, that's our best information indicates that it's stable. So um, I'm not sure if I answered your question, Katria, but, but um, the other thing about walruses is they are a, a, 
classic species in terms of, of their reproductive ecology. They take a long time to, to mature and um, they don't have that many calves. So the population doesn't make change a lot between years in terms of, um, in terms of what we can detect and what people can, can detect and measure, right? It's not changing that much at all um, from our perspective. We just can't detect that at this point. Um, it's gonna take a pretty big change for us to be able to detect it in, our, in the modeling that we do right now. We're hoping to change that in the future with, um, with some future work, but for right now it's very limited in terms of the age structure data. Seems like there's, did that get I'm happy, it? To, happy did, to answer, did that help? follow did up. That help? I hope that helps. <laughs> yeah, that helps a bit. Yeah, thank you. Like if we had better information, if it was like a, a ground squirrel or something where we're capturing animals every year, it would only have to be stable for two consecutive years for, for someone to say it's stable. But for walruses, it's a little bit longer time period just because of their, their basically their ecology and how they reproduce. Okay, thank you. That's mm -hmm. helpful. And we have several questions. I'm going to go to the chat for a sec and knock these out. So what is the age structure in 2015? That was Linda Shaw. Oh, Linda, put me on the spot here. I'd have to dig up that data. It's actually on the website, on the USGS Alaska Science Center website. So, so maybe, maybe is it something you can do when Irina is getting her yep, I, um, presentation? Yep. That's exactly what I do. I'll drop it in the chat while she's talking. You'll drop it in the chat. That's awesome. And then the last chat question, then we'll go to the people, is from the Metcalfs. It is a little confusing about the change in the population from 1980 and current. 1980 was 254,890, and 2017 is 257,193. They look very similar. Where's the decline? But let me look at that chat again. I think. Let's go back to that graph. I think where it's coming from. So I'm, I'm wondering where the 1980 estimate came from. Is it this graph? I'm guessing it is. Um, so the caveat for these first four points is that the reason that these were stopped was that a bunch of people, a bunch of Walrus folks in Russia and the US realized that, hey, we are missing a big portion of the population. The way we sample and the way we account for Walruses that are underwater and that we don't see basically, right? So. These point estimates here um, have actually, or actually thought, and by point estimates, I mean these black black dots here, are actually thought to be um, underestimates for the walrus population. There's a comment in the chat, if it helps, that the 1980s, this is from Vladimir oh, Burkhanov, yeah. is the 1980s is Fedosev's estimate. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, th that would apply to the Fedosev's estimate as well, which I'm familiar with. So, um, yeah, they're thought to be significant underestimates now. In 2006, that aerial survey, that's probably, um, the best way to put that is that was the first time that, that the techniques, the survey technique and the, uh, the analysis method could be honest about how uncertain we are about how many walruses are out there from an aerial survey. It accounted for walruses that are underwater in unsampled areas. And the reason that interval is so big is that walruses, we know that walruses occur in these really huge aggregations, right? Tens of thousands of animals on the sea ice even. And so if you miss three or four of those, when you're doing an aerial survey, you're missing a lot of walruses, right? And that's gonna really affect your overall estimate. And so that's, that was another driving factor. And um, that was another big factor in, um, in the thought that it was an underestimate in 1980. That's why ultimately aerial surveys were abandoned and um, kind of reformulated for the 2006 survey. And then the 2006 survey showed that really we just can't, can't count walruses very well from the air because they're just occurring these huge groups. And of course, there's no way we can, we can survey their entire geographic range. I hope that helps.
Metcalfs, did that answer your question? Okay. With that, all right, we're going to switch up because there are people being patient, and we're going to drop back down into the chat again. So Vladimir Burkhanov has been very patient with his hand up. Go ahead. Go uh, ahead. Th thank you. My question actually was related to the previous question. How that estimate 2015 relates with the estimate in uh, 1980s? Because I also remember it was 2000, uh, 250,000 animals. But... Uh, I completely satisfied with Beagle's answer. That's true because I did acti actively work during that 1980s in Kamchatka, in Kamchatka, and we had a uh, large population of walruses in Kamchatka. We had, I think, 18 fallouts along Kamchatka coast, including Karaginsky Gulf and even south of Karaginsky Gulf, and uh, that definitely was large population and uh, but survey method that FEDASEF used it was related to survey walruses on haulouts. I remember they were very much excited when on Iron uh, Arakam Chechen Island uh, north of Providenia Michigan Bay they counted 50,000 walruses everyone was just shocked so many walruses and then also they used the uh, age uh, sex structure from the harvest data and put in all the magic numbers they estimated abundance 250,000. And everyone who was knowledgeable specialist at that time, I remember that exactly because I participated in the meetings. They were kind of very uh, sure that the population probably around 250,000 animals and we thought that's on the peak of the number and i think the method the bill used this this time it's a absolutely new method for uh, i think even marine mammals uh, abundance estimate especially for walruses and it looks like really promising and really uh, allows to to get uh, more accurate data so the difference in those estimation related first of all with different methods that used for estimation and I'm very much sure that population in 1980s uh, was uh, much higher, at least twice higher. That's what Bill shows here. It was at least twice higher during that time. And that probably is quite accurate, quite true. Thank you. And in the chat, actually, thank you, um, Vladimir. And the, the Metcalfs added the question is related that they had. The question is related to the 2017 estimate. Yeah, so I, I guess I guess um, they're asking about the comparing that the 2017 estimate for the mark recapture to the aerial survey estimates. My best answer for that, from a, the perspective of, is is not to compare the two. Basically, that for the reasons that I outlined, the aerial surveys were were um, not accounting for walruses that were underwater, and that for the not really counting very well for how widely distributed the the population was um, and how heterogeneous we call it heterogeneously distributed basically means in these huge aggregations and right if you think about it if you miss a, a couple of those huge aggregations in the plane and you're going to miss more than a couple you're going to miss a lot actually that's really going to affect how many walruses are out there and your and your how you're calculating that so that was one of the big things, big reasons that they, the, the aerial surveys were discontinued in 1990. And they didn't do one again until 2006 because everybody knew there was a big problem with these aerial surveys and that they were just underestimating, were underestimating the population. And even people at the time thought it was a, about half of what people, these estimates were. So it was thought that we were not even getting more than half in terms of these estimates. So. Um, it, it does track with some of the, the anecdotal, anecdotal, um, yeah, well, I'll stop there and, and see if that, if um, I don't want to take up too much of Irina's time here. All right, we actually, hopefully that helped Metcalfs. We're actually getting people that some of the callers are, can't unmute. 
Um, and so they're trying to figure out a way to text in. So um, given that, Charlie, you're next up. Go ahead. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I, so I, I'm just trying to remember. I was a crab biologist in, in the 80s here in Nome, and, and uh, we were concerned about the decline of Greenland cockles, a, a preferred food of walrus as well as crab. And the, the walrus guys came up from some from uh, California diving, inventorying clam populations in the near vicinity of Nome. And we're, I was very interested in the, the clam data. They told me that, well, the, we're very concerned about walrus because the walrus population is skewed very old. So lots of old animals. We think it's going to be in steep decline for a while because the cows are past their prime and, and there's, they're not producing as many offspring as they used to. And we were, we were debating, was it food related or was it age related? Why were the, why were the walrus in decline? And uh, so I don't remember the numbers and I don't remember the methods very well, but I, I remember that controversy. And uh, as, a, as a biologist, sometimes you look at the age composition to determine trends when you don't have good survey data. So I wondered if, if some of that came from the, uh, from the population dynamic aspects. That's my question. Charlie, can I just ask you what, what year about what, I missed that part. If you mentioned what year you were talking about there in terms of the, the older animals, you noticed that? It was in the mid eighties. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, that definitely tracks with, with everything that we, we see in um, old reports and kind of gray literature that there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of, um, I won't say um, maybe older animals, but also kind of hungry animals. I won't use any other term aside from that, that they just didn't look in the best body condition then, but that's very great literature. But, um, but and even in the age structure day in the 1980s, this pretty, pretty clearly shows it's actually remarkable. And, and I'll, I'll get that link up um, to that data set on um, when Irene is speaking, so folks can look at it. It's actually remarkable how old the population was at that point. Um, but the um, but the walrus population trend that I'm showing here in the slide that um, almost that's exclusively coming from I would I shouldn't not exclusively but that is for the most part coming from the age structure data. There's lots of other data sources in this model. I I, I didn't want to pick it apart. It's it's a it's kind of just more information that we need than that I need, honestly. Um, you know, there's things in there um, on the harvest. There's thing. There's other other things in there as well. So, um, but the age structure data um, you can just see is really driving the walrus population trend in the decline. And so that's where this this information is coming from is that age structure data. All right. Does that get at it, Charlie? Yeah. Okay. I, 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 like I said, I was shuff, shuffling through an old memory. So I, that's what I remember. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you very much for your question. And Hector Douglas. Um, I had just wanted to ask if uh, there was any more information about what the food limitation was, if that if I heard correctly, there was a food limitation that was hypothesized to be driving the uh, decline in the population. I, I wasn't sure if I'd missed something, but I didn't, wasn't clear. That is, that's a great question, Hector, and it's something we'll probably never get a really good handle on. It was driven by um, anecdotal reports and, um, and local knowledge, essentially, and biologists going out there saying that that these walruses look like they're not getting enough to eat, essentially. Um, in addition to the age structure data, which, which there's lots of reason the population can can get old and not reproduce, but, um, but at the time it all kind of lined up that it was getting old and not reproducing because there were these animals that were just not getting enough energy, um, not getting enough food to 
to make that big energy investment of reproduction, essentially. Anyone with little kids knows it takes a lot of energy to, uh, to raise little ones. So, and walruses are no different. All right. With that, uh, Vladimir, I see your hand is up. We have just a couple questions in the chat. Are you still, do you have a question still? No, I just want to add, I forgot to add, mention that uh, uh, that um, estimate that Bill provided here, I think it's very uh, true. And uh, one of confirmation that estimate, we have over 100,000 individual walruses hollowed on um, Serza Kamen area. So uh, if in 1980s, uh, people, researchers were very wonder when they counted 50,000 walruses and gave estimation 250,000 uh, total population. Now we've seen at least half of that population in one place, only one particular place. So I think that 250, it's, it's a quite true number. That's what was uh, only my addition. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Vladimir. That's a good, that's an excellent point. Yeah, with the historical hot numbers there. And um, this is, so thank you, Vladimir. And for the callers at Gamble that are trying to get through, my cell phone, you know, if you can find a way to text 907-434-9400. One one four nine. Sometimes Zoom drives me nuts. I've unmuted you, and it still seems like this is not uh, a go. But but feel free to either call, which would mean you'd have to get off here. But if you have another cell phone or someone else does in the room that that can text, go ahead and text your question, and we'll I'll ask it to the speaker. Um, there are two last questions in the chat, so a lot of good. And don't worry about the time, Irina, except that you know it means you're up later. <laughs> because you're on a different time zone. But for Bill, Rhonda Sparks, hi Rhonda, has, can you talk to the challenge of limiting research mark recapture to US waters only impacting the po popul... Oh, can you talk to the challenge of limiting research mark recapture to US waters only, how it impacts the population estimates? How much How much time do you have, Rhonda? <laughs> um, there's a... There's a there's a lot of different ways that it can actually impact the estimates. Um, and it really just depends on how animals move um, be, in terms of when they're coming back up through the Bering Strait each spring, whether they decide to go over to Russia or to the US side, and also how they move during the month of June when they're out there sampling. So there's lots of different ways that can actually impact the population estimate. It could it could make it an underestimate. Um, that's probably the most likely scenario. Um, it could make it an overestimate. That's also a scenario, but it could be could not affect it at all. Honestly, um, at this point, we don't even have the the, the tagging data to say for sure, um, which which we hope to address this question in the future with with new approaches to estimating walrus population abundance, which Irene is going to touch on in her presentation, which we think will have the power to account for that. But we definitely know it's an issue, and it's we actually discuss it at length in, in the published paper in this um, kind of lay out all the different ways that it could it could affect it. Um, it's essentially unknown exactly how it's affecting it. But it, and it could be multiple different ways. Um, I will um, I will say that 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 if you could use your unlimited resources and and the political capital, obviously sampling in both Russian and U.S. waters is obviously the best case scenario. We know they're over there during the month of June, and we know a substantial number of them are over there in the month of June. And um, it was only possible to to sample over there with the help of of Vladimir Burkhanov. Um, and his colleagues to help us get over there with the, in the two years that we did. So uh, I'm glad he's on the call here to see the, the fruits of all of his work. So over the years, but it definitely could impact it. The, the short answer is we, we, we're not quite sure how it's impacting it. And the last question is, and you got to thank you back from Rhonda. So, and the last question is uh, from Carolina Pavic. Pavic. Can you elaborate on the types of analysis conducted from the biopsy samples? Is there a name yeah. yeah, so the, the main thing we do with the biopsy samples is we, we bring them back to the ship um, 
and we basically process them. We put them in an ethanol tube, and then we you just leave them on the counter at that point. And you bring them back to the to the lab, and you um, basically extract DNA from them. You go through this whole protocol for extracting DNA um, from tissue, and then you um, conduct um, conduct a, a genotyping through what we call the a SNP chip. It's a it's a technology used to generate um, genetic data pretty quickly and efficiently. And then basically what you get for each sample is you get the alphabet soup of DNA. So G's and C's, A's and T's basically um, for each animal and you get, we had about 120 different, what we call loci. So for each loci you had an A, a C or a G or a T and you string those together, you get enough variation to figure out, um, identify individuals and that's what we did. Um, in terms of the uh, other other analyses, um, Irina is going to uh, touch on that as well, and the other other things we can do with that. Um, aside from the approach we did here at genetic marker capture, there's other analyses you can do with that genetic data. So there's a lot lot of other things even beyond that. But um, I don't want to take up too much too much of Irina's time here. She's got a lot of cool things to talk about as well. Um, perfect so, segue, perfect yeah. segue, Bill, into Irina, who's been patiently waiting. You can already see. Um, maybe we can we can get to your question, Carolyn. We let's launch into Irina first, and we'll bring it back to your question. Um, so you can see the interest in walruses in the Bering Strait region when when we get a chance to to hear right from the the scientists. So we should have probably broken this into two. But Irina has been waiting patiently, and she's going to bring us home. Tell us, and don't mind the time because we certainly don't. You're talking about walruses, and we could stay up all night, honestly. I mean, you know, but. You can't probably because you're already ahead of us. So take it away, Arena. Thank you so much. And thanks for your patience. Thank you so much, Gay. And thanks everybody for being with us tonight. Um, so we are going to continue with the second part of our seminar. And as Bill mentioned, we are launching this second generation of Walrus genetic mark recapture cruises starting already this summer. And I'm going to talk about our research plans, objectives, and provide a little bit of an insight into how these cruises are going to be different from the previous effort. Uh, so first of all, why have we decided to resume collection of genetic samples from walruses? As Bill mentioned, we have thousands of samples collected and processed. We have our abundance estimate in hand. So why start all over again? So, well, everything changes and uh, climate is changing, environment we live in is changing, and so are the wild population of marine mammals and walruses. So in order to be able to address walrus co-management issues and ensure proactive conservation and sustainable use of walrus stocks, we need to have up-to-date information on walrus population dynamics, not only point estimates of abundance, but as Bill uh, mentioned, also the trend. So we have to know whether the population is stable, it's increasing or declining. And in order to obtain this up-to-date estimates and information, US Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Service and US Geological Survey uh, are planning to carry out another three to five research cruises with three years of research being the minimal requirement, and the results obtained during these three years of uh, research will tell us whether we need to do two more cruises or not. The overall primary objectives stay the same. We plan to collect genetic biopsies from walruses, hauling out on ice, and collect sex and age composition data from walrus groups. The data collected uh, then will be used in the integrated population model in order to estimate abundance, trends, uh, and demographic parameters, similar to the way uh, that Bill described before. Uh, next slide, please. So this year, uh, we will be working in the US waters only, uh, starting the cruise in the Bering Sea and moving north through the Bering Strait to the Chukchi Sea, following the retreating ice age. Uh, this first cruise will occur already in June this year, and our research vessel will depart from and arrive to Nome. Next slide, please. Uh, we will be working aboard uh, research vessel Norseman 2, 
And we will use uh, small uh, rigid hull boats to approach and sample walruses once we encounter them on sea ice. When the ship is in position, uh, three skiffs or small boats will be deployed so that up to three different groups of walruses can be approached and sampled at the same time. And uh, similar to the previous cruises, the boat cruise will consist of one driver and at least two people collecting biopsy samples. And walrus groups will be approached to within 10 to 30 meters to, for sample collection. In support uh, of the vessel operations, uh, we will use aerial reconnaissance uh, to locate groups of walrus on the sea ice. We will use aerial commander twin engine aircraft, uh, which will be flying out of Kotzebue and Utkiagvik, Alaska. And the air crew will conduct a targeted search along the ice margin to locate groups of walruses in the study area as long as necessary until our sampling is completed. The information on location of aggregation of walruses uh, will be transmitted to Norseman crew uh, in near real time. And the vessel will transit to the general location of the sighting um, and sampling of walruses will occur in the following days. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so the research crew uh, aboard the Norseman will include fish and wildlife service scientists who will be responsible for collecting biopsy samples uh, and U.S. geological survey scientists who will be collecting uh, age and sex uh, structure composition, uh, sex composition data. And it is very important to us that like in the previous cruises, we will have three native hunters, two from Savunga and one from Gamble participating in the cruise with us. Uh, they will be working alongside the genetic mark recapture crew, providing guidance on walrus behavior and sea ice conditions and taking part in sample collection. From the previous cruises, we know that hunters' participation in, in this work is crucial for uh, having successful and safe field season. And we are very grateful to our management partners, uh, Eskimo Walrus Commission, for their help in identifying the hunters uh, interested in this project and bringing them on board. Uh, next, next slide. Similar to previous cruises, uh, we will collect age and, ex and sex composition data on walrus uh, observed on ice. And we will use the same approach like before to collect small pieces of skin from walruses uh, using crossbows and arrows with biopsy tips. In addition to that, uh, we will also collect walrus feces from ice and uh, those samples will be analyzed with a procedure called DNA metabarcoding. And this procedure allows to examine animals diet and see how it change in, changes in space and time. Uh, another valuable addition to the sampling protocol is that we will have a specialist from EcoHub project on the cruise with us, uh, who will be collecting samples of sediments, benthos, seawater, as, well, as well as walrus feces. Uh, and those will be analyzed uh, for the presence of harmful algae and algal toxins, the moic acid and saxitoxin. And, um, we realized that the harmful algae blooms and associated high concentration of these toxins uh, in the food web in the North Pacific and the Arctic, uh, it's a serious concern for the communities uh, as well as researchers and managers. And uh, therefore collaborating with uh, the group led by Katie Le Fay, uh, with the ECHA projects, uh, we hope that we will have an opportunity to contribute to this important research. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so coming back to walrus biopsy samples, um, we aim to collect at least 1,800 skin samples per cruise, and those samples will be handled according to DNA handling protocols like uh, Bill described before, uh, and processed uh, at a dedicated uh, genetic laboratory. Like in uh, genetic mark recapture study uh, that we did during the first generation of cruises, we will be using the same uh, single nucleotide polymorphism markers or SNPs to identify individual walruses. Uh, but this time we will use a much longer 
a SNP array uh, for identification. So Bill mentioned that last time we used uh, 120 loci, uh, so a short piece of DNA essentially, uh, to identify individuals. But this time we go for 3,000 um, SNPs. And this will allow us not only to identify a particular individual based on its DNA uh, with a very high level of precision, but also find related pairs or next of kin among uh, sample walruses. Uh, so we will be able to identify parents and offspring, uh, full siblings and half siblings. This approach uh, that uses frequency of identification of close kin pairs in the population uh, for estimation of population abundance is referred to as close kin mark recapture as opposed to genetic mark recapture that uh, uses self recaptures only. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so when the samples are processed, uh, we will compare genetic information from different samples to identify individuals recaptured multiple times and then identify kin pairs and estimate their recapture rate. The uh, kinship data collected over multiple years will be combined with population, population age and sex composition data in an integrated population model to estimate uh, sex and age-specific survival of walrus, their reproductive rates, um, and obtain an updated estimate of abundance, of course. And um, I guess an important question that you might have is why uh, border switching from this uh, to this more complex closed kin mark recapture method requiring more complex genetic processing and more sophisticated analytical framework to handle the data uh, when there is already existing genetic mark recapture methods that Bill described and that method was used previously and it was successfully tested in the field and provided required results. So the answer to that as uh, can be long, but um, I'll just point out a couple of advantages that this new uh, closed kin mark recapture method has uh, over the traditional genetic mark recapture approach. So first of all, uh, recapturing the same individual even twice over several years of study is extremely rare event. Uh, from previous cruises, we know that that happened only about in one percent of marked or sampled walruses uh, that get re resampled more than once. And this leads to a necessity to collect many thousands of samples over at least five years of consecutive cruises to obtain the desired rate of precision of the estimate. So this currency that Bill talked about, the recaptures, is very, very rare uh, in this gen uh, genetic mark recapture approach when we're trying to resample individuals. In close kin mark recapture, in turn, each sampled individual marks not only itself, uh, but also its parents, offsprings, and all the siblings that it might have. So after sampling one individual, we can then um, get recaptures, even when we sample any of uh, its close relatives. Therefore, we can achieve a needed quantity of recaptures much, much faster with small number of samples and so it's a chance for us to be able to reduce the amount of time and efforts and money spent sampling the population each time when we need an updated population estimate. Another uh, benefit provided by closed skin mark recapture is that um, we can use lethal samples. So for example, sample collected from harvested or freshly stranded animals can be used in, uh, in this method, as opposed to genetic mark recapture, where we needed the individual to stay alive after being sampled in order to be recapt recaptured again. So we expect that uh, utilizing uh, this combination of life and little sampling in the closed skin mark recapture framework will help us to reduce the cost of uh, regular population, uh, large population assessments and help obtain the abundance estimates uh, more frequently and reliably. reliably. Uh, next slide. Yeah, and so on this note, um, 
I would like to thank the audience for their interest in this project. And uh, thank you again, Gay, for inviting us to present our work. And I suppose we can take questions if there is any. Oh, there are. Thank you so much, both of you, Irina and Bill. I mean, this was really very interesting and lots of information to wrap our heads around. And while people, this is the time when I ask the street science uh, audience, which is a, a famously good, um, to give both Bill and Irina a little love in the chat box because it is never easy to be a public speaker. I know that personally. <laughs> and uh, it's never easy. They're both out on different time zones. And, um, and again, I'm going to give a shout out also to our callers. I'm so sorry for some reason you are not able to make it through. Um, but if you do have questions and you are able to text, try 907-434-1149. So while we're, that's all going on and people are thinking of their question, um, I think that was, yours was really interesting. It was great to have the one too, because um, I think the new methodology might get away, may, might make a difference, right? Is that what you're saying, Irina? There'll be a lot less um, samples needed? That's, that's the goal, that we will be able to reduce the number of samples needed and the number of years spent in order to get this abundance estimates that we're looking for. And in my mind, my mind immediately goes to less walruses being kind of bothered. You know, they have a lot on their minds nowadays to deal with between, you know, tankers and LNG tankers and everything else and Pollock and everything else that seems to be sort of giving them the what for showing up here. Um, I'm sure walrus have a lot on their minds these days trying to navigate everything that, like we are, having to navigate all these changes. So that just seems like a wonderful, um, wonderful evolution of how walrus, this the mystery of counting walruses um, is headed. So that's pretty exciting. All right, there are questions. We'll leave off with um, Bill. I think this one is for you. This was Carolina. She asked, were the tissue DNA samples that the skin biopsies that you were taking with the arrows um or were those cataloged for future use by other people yeah great great question so we'll be um and i will throw some of this to irena but we will be using those from those samples from 2013 to 2017 in the close kin mark recapture analysis that irena discussed so we'll be reanalyzing those um those samples and we'll be using them so they are still at Fish World Lab Service in Anchorage um, in the freezer at the lab. In terms of the long-term plans for archiving those with, with the museum at UAF, for example, um, I, I can't speak to that because those are in the possession um, of Fish World Lab Service. And I'm not sure if Irina can either actually, but I'll toss it to Irina, no. <laughs> but the UAF Museum of the North is a great place because that allows yeah. public yeah. access, we, yeah. We, we definitely have categorized other samples there before and, and um, yeah, we, we, it's best, definitely been discussed, but we know we'll be using them for this next generation of the project. So we're still a ways away from, from actually doing anything with them beyond um, after we finish with the close kin. So any thoughts on that to add, Irina, on DNA? Uh, no, I think, I think uh, yeah, Bill covered it. So yeah, we use them for the CKMR first. And then if there is anything left, uh, it's being discussed at the moment, what to do with those samples. If we have them, we can, we might as well archive them. Uh, yeah, and, and Irina said if, there, if there's anything left, because there's, there's not much left of some of the samples right now, so. Okay. And then Orlin uh, had asked in the chat, and this is for everyone on the phone, because it does get answered in the chat, Orlin asked, did you do any sampling of the stomach contents or the unic, the feces, for the algal toxins? Um, and I think that got answered. You're going to start now. We right? will do that. Yes, uh, not, not us, but uh, Katie LaFay's group, uh, they will be with us on the cruise and they will um, collect feces and analyze them for the toxins. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and that's wonderful. Um, and in the chat, Bill Beatty had also answered, we did not sample stomach contents because we did not handle the walruses. They're just shooting those little arrows at them, I think, to get a chunk of skin. This year, we will be conducting some sampling for this EcoHab study, which is Kathy LaFay and which is going on strong in the Bering Strait region. So that is, um, and I think there'll be more on this 
Campbell and Savunga and Bering Street peeps. We are worried about harmful algal blooms uh, and, and some of what that may mean for our benthic, our, our animals that are eating, well, for all of us, actually, for all of us, what it may mean for all of us, meaning seabirds, people, the marine mammals, and so forth. So we have some concerns on that, as well as avian influenza, which also has jumped into marine mammals uh, in other parts of the United States and other countries in the Northern Hemisphere. So um, we really appreciate, I think we, we didn't mention it, it was in the chat before the recording I was on, but you guys were going to potentially maybe contact and swab some of, if you came across a dead animal, you were going to also sample for that. So wonderful, wonderful. Um, and those are things on our minds. Okay. Um, Rhonda Sparks again in the chat. What is the timeline for the data analysis and how would we access it? I can take that. So uh, we will be analyzing samples as, as we collect them. So after each cruise, all the samples will be um, analyzed right away. And based on our um, estimates, it's probably going to take about a, about a year for the whole process to analyze each uh, cruise year separately. But then in order to get to the estimates, uh, what we are after, uh, we'll have to complete the whole series of cruises, three years at the minimum. And then uh, probably it will take another year or two for, for the uh, statistical analysis of the data. Um, so we are trying to speed up the process. Hopefully CKMR, closed skin market capture will help us to speed up the process, but it's not fast. Um, and then, um, yeah, we are hoping and we are planning on uh, keeping the communities and Eskimo Walrus Commission informed every year on our cruise results. And then as soon as the uh, we have the data, all the data will be published um, yeah, and accessible to the communities. And we're going to try to get you to do a straight science when you're done as well, so we can all join in and listen together at the same time and get you some coverage on that if you're up for that. Um, and my question is, when do we see you? And you may have been, there's been a lot going on behind the scenes over here. And the question, I may have missed it, but when is your ship, which is called the Norseman 2, when is it going to, when are we going to see it in Nome? It's going to arrive to Nome about um, around June 4th, um, leaving on June 5th. And then when will we see you return, potentially? July 2nd. Uh, July, okay, there we go. I must have missed that slide and all of it. July 2nd, all right. Well, we hope you stay around for the July 4th parade and all that because Nome knows how to do July 4th better than, than most. So we do a big July 4th thing here. Um, with that, any other questions in the chat? I again apologize to those online if you were unable to come in. And with that, I would say... Irina and Bill are going to stick around for a second. And okay. even that, yeah, go ahead, iPhone. Hey, this is Bivers. Hi, Bivers. Hey, um, there, I joined the, uh, this webinar. What do you call it? Straight science. I, I joined, yeah, I joined it late, but uh, there was a little bit of conversation I heard in regards to the walrus population declining back. In the uh, 1980s, uh, I was living in Savunga at the time, doing a lot of walrus hunting with the community, and uh, we had abundance of walrus during that a lot of eight 1980s, and a lot of them were very healthy. They had a lot of food in their stomach because uh, every time we get a walrus, we're uh, taking the clams out. And just about every walrus, every hunter that was out there uh, getting walrus, there was a bunch of uh, clams in his stomach, uh, which we we love to eat and love to, uh, or one of the foods that we love to eat. But uh, the difference I know from hunting back home versus hunting here, the clams are different here in Nome area versus out on St. Lawrence Island. They look a lot smaller. I've never seen them type of clams before. Um, is there a different type of diet they have uh, around the mainland area versus out on St. Lawrence Island? And the other question is, 
You know, my son Orlin asked a pretty good question in regards to having his stomach content um, checked out. Um, would any of the communities that um, still provide samples for U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, can they also do the sampling for the clams, if not like the feces? Because uh, as hunters, you know, there's feces all over on the ice. When uh, Could that be one of the things that the hunters can do to help uh, study for algae or something like that? I, I can answer that one, but I'll let, I will answer that one when, when Irina and Bill finish. Thank you, Bob. Okay. That's a good question. So I guess I'll briefly chime in on the first question, which was which is a great question. And unfortunately, I, I don't have the expertise to answer that in terms of differences between the, the benthic communities between Nome and, and St. Lawrence Island. Um, it wouldn't surprise me if there were differences in terms of the the species and families and even the ages of, of the benthic community. That's also a, a pretty big deal that we're seeing in, in terms of the bivalves and clams out there, how, how old they are, it matters as well. So um, so that I'll leave it at that. I wish <laughs> wish I could help you there. That's that's a there's probably a difference. I just get I unfortunately can't speak to exactly what that is or what's driving that. Um, there's whole USGS, we have benthic ecologists. I wish one of them was here, but um, they're they're not. So Irina, do you have any thoughts to add? Um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah, I can't really add in, um, nothing much either. But uh, in terms of collecting um, pieces and collecting clams, uh, I know there is a uh, fish and wildlife service has been running uh, Boros harvest monitoring program for many years. Unfortunately, it's been on pause this year for various reasons, but we are trying to uh, keep going and we are collaborating with um, USGS, with Karen Rhodes, and we also work with um, KTL Affairs Group. Um, I know um, has been doing a lot of um, research out there. So through those programs, there might be opportunities and for hunters to participate and help collect the feces and uh, you know the tissues and clams as well. Um, yeah, but unfortunately, I'm not. Yeah not the part of that program. So I guess some of my colleagues can answer, could answer that questions better. But. Okay. So Bivers, you ask, so thank you, Bill. And thank you, Irina. So Bivers, you ask a very good question. How do we locally, because so, so everyone here, you know, this talk was on the, the, their population estimate crews, but they're even reaching out and going to try to help with this harmful algal bloom and even the avian influenza question. If hunters locally absolutely want to collect feces off the ice, that's all you need to do is put it in a baggie and put the date and kind of a rough estimate where you are. If you have GPS, that's wondrous. We're going to be, we're kind of in a little bit of a world of hurt, honestly, for near sh offshore kind of knowledge of what's going on. There are some things, and I think we should probably in Nome have a meeting, and I should call you, Bivers, because maybe we could get locally some of the the, the active boaters together. Um, what we are going to need is more offshore, just like if you are offshore and you see uh, anuk on the ice, feces on the ice. Um, that will be a help because we're going to be using animals as kind of a proxy to find out if we are in any kind of, uh, uh, you know, what the algae level is. During spring hunt, I don't have a lot of concern that it's going to be high, but we don't know. And it's not something I feel comfortable risking. If anybody wants to help participate, we will take those samples locally. We do work with the EcoHab project. We Norton Sound Health Corporation is also working. We are all collaborating on this together, as well as Chuck Manadaluk with Kuwerik. So know that we just had a meeting, the three of us, and we are going to whatever needs to get done and whatever we can do to get at it to keep us, uh, this region informed as to what's going on in our ocean, we will give it a try. So thank you for that. And we should talk more later. But if anyone hearing this in the caller list from the other locations outside of Nome, know that we are interested. There is going to, we will take all any and all samples. Um, and what we need is a day and a location. If you're gonna be gathering stuff off the ice or sending in, you can also put about a three foot section 
of uncleaned intestine from down near the anus in a bag, freeze it, call me. And again, we'll get that on its way to know wherever you are in the North, in the Bering Strait region. Okay, with that, um, there was someone, Linda Shaw, I'm sorry, I passed over it quickly. Is anyone access, assessing the status of walrus prey? And I think we heard the answer there for in regards to this Fish and Wildlife USGS project, but know that the there are many cruises, research cruises coming to the Northern Bering Sea and on, on up. And especially in the Northern Bering Sea, we will be getting information. There's a bottom trawl survey that NOAA Race Division is doing. There are, there's other cruises that are coming in the area. And hopefully you'll hear about those uh, later in the summer as we get going. But those are going to be um, looking at the numbers of things that walrus, not necessarily just clams, and not just, it's not assessing for walrus, it's assessing the ecosystem, how the ecosystem is doing. And um, we'll know a little bit more when the NOAA bottom trawl survey people are complete their survey. And they usually give us a straight science, I want to say by Halloween, somewhere around there. So I hope that helps answer that question. And I think there's one more, just check in the chat. And Hector Douglas says the influence of the nutrient rich onadir current over on the Russian side, moving north, combined with the broad shelf at St. Lawrence Island would have a profound effect on the benthic community, the seafloor community. Nome area is more strongly influenced by the Alaska coastal current that comes on up our side and the near shore has been changing. Thank you for adding that. Um, those insights, Hector, very much appreciate your input. With that, the next straight science will be Thursday, May 4th, next week. Going to be a different kind of straight science. It's not really to science, it, but it is important. It's going to be radio in Western Alaska. We are going to have both KNOM and KICY. They have a desire to be on straight science, and since they help us out a lot, we are going to have them talk to us about the history of radio in Western Alaska, what they're doing, and how it all um, helps this region. So I'm kind of interested to see what they come up with. I'm a big radio listener, so I think this will be very interesting. And of course, as we know, this also has a lot of uh, transboundary implications as they communicate to our neighbors to the, to the West. So I'm very interested to hear about more about KNOM and KICY and what they do for us in the Bering Strait region. With that, we hope to see you all next time. And thank you so much for coming. And again, Gamble, if there's a way, those callers, you guys have made it through. It, text me and I will hunt down Bill Beatty and Irina Trukanova and get you an answer. So if there's a way to call me after this is over or send me an email or something, we will get you an answer. So thank you for sticking with it. With that, everybody have a good night and we'll see you next time. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good night.